Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 47 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is Mark, your host. I'm calling this episode In the Pilot Seat with James Blatch, mostly because if you're familiar with the self-publishing formula podcast, you'll likely recognize James Blatch as Mark Dawson's right-hand man, his co-host, or perhaps his co-pilot for the podcast and the courses. But I wanted to put James in the pilot seat and go on a flight with him, focusing on his writing his background as a reporter, a videographer, and of course as a pilot. And we get the chance to talk about his forthcoming book, The Last Flight. And this is a conversation that James and I had just last week at the 20 Books to 50K conference in Vegas, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, from the first moment that I met James a few years ago at NINC, or Novelist Inc., I warmed up to him immediately. And it wasn't just because I had been familiar with his voice as the co-host of a popular podcast. It's because James is a fabulous guy with a great attitude and a wonderful sense of humor. Speaking of which, his hilarious Twitter bio reads, writing a book due out any decade now, which is kind of a running joke uh, for this novel, The Last Flight, that we'll be talking uh, about. And I, and I rib him about a little bit in the podcast. But you'll get to experience a bit of that in the forthcoming interview. But first, a word about our sponsor, and then I will provide a personal update. Now, I mentioned how meeting James, I had felt almost like I had known him because his voice was in my head once a week for a long time before we'd first met in person. Audio can create a powerful and intimate connection in that way. And that's the power of audio, and that's the power of audiobooks. Audiobooks are a great way for people to read books while they are on the go doing something else with their hands, washing the dishes, taking the dog for a walk, all kinds of other things. And Find Away Voices is a company dedicated to making it easier for indie authors to get their self-published works into audiobook format and distributed to a global market of audiobook retailers and libraries while maintaining full control and not giving up your rights for an exclusive seven-year period. Now, you can find out more about how you can get support and help from Find Away Voices at starkreflections.com ca slash findaway. I would like also to take a moment to thank patrons for their support and sponsorship of this podcast. I truly appreciate your generosity in helping to pay for my time in producing the show. And this week, I'd like to welcome aboard new patron Jan Field to the team. Thank you, Jan, and welcome aboard. Jan, you and the other show patrons now have access to additional patron-only content at patreon.com slash starkreflections. For my personal update, the biggest thing on my mind and in my heart this week is the death of Stan Lee. For those who don't know, Stan Lee was a writer and the founder of Marvel Comics He's the genius behind such characters as Iron Man, the Hulk, Thor, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, Black Panther, Daredevil, Doctor Strange, and Ant-Man. Of course, the character he created that resonated so incredibly deeply with me was Spider-Man, which he co-created with artist Steve Ditko. It wasn't just Spider-Man, because that was only one aspect of the character. The other, the one that struck me deeply, was Peter Parker. 
When Spider-Man first appeared, teenage characters in comic books were usually relegated to sidekick roles. Think of such characters as Captain America's Bucky or Batman's sidekick Robin. Teenage characters, sidekicks. But not only was Peter Parker the first major teenage superhero, but he was also a loner, a loser, a weakling with few friends who was constantly dealing with self-doubt, with rejection, inadequacy, and loneliness. When he donned the costume, he could become something bigger than himself. He could be a wise-cracking superhero, saving the day and making the streets of New York safer for the average person. But when the costume came off, he was right back into that role of lonely and often pathetic, quiet kid who was shunned from the cool circles. And in the meantime, though he spent his non-school hours fighting crime, he was at the center of a smear campaign from the city's newspaper, um, the newspaper owner, J. Jonah Jameson, who believed that he was a menace and not a hero. And then as Parker grew older, the shy and nerdy teen grew up to be a young man who struggled with trying to balance, you know, college schoolwork and work and keep the great A average that he had. He's scrambling to come up with enough pennies to rub together in order to pay the rent each month. Not to mention constantly worrying about his aging and frail beloved Aunt May. Parker dealt with so much anxiety that he actually developed an ulcer in the series of the comic books. He was dealing with realistic issues that everyday people faced. I deeply identified with a nerdy teenager. Reading about him, about Parker's struggles, about his willingness to keep fighting the good fight regardless of the mud flung in his direction, both as a misunderstood hero and as an outcast and a nerdy student. He kept wanting to do good. He kept wanting to fight the good fight. Stan Lee crafted a character that I could deeply identify with. A character that I wanted to read about. He created stories that I wanted to escape into, to enjoy and fantasize about. I wanted to be Spider-Man. I wanted to be able to shuck off my own nerdy persona and put on a costume and become Spider-Man and, and do good and help other people. I mean, anyone who knows me knows I'm a huge fan of Spider-Man. I even wrote about a love of Spider-Man, the, the belief in the mantra of with great power comes great responsibility into the character of Michael Andrews, who's the main character in my Canadian werewolf in New York novel. Stan Lee inspired me. He helped me identify with Peter Parker. And he inspired me to also want to tell my own fantastical stories. Though I never had the privilege of meeting him, he was a mentor and an inspiration to me. And he will continue to be. It's funny, my son called me as soon as he found out that Stan Lee died to ask if I had heard See, I'd, I'd passed my love and respect for Stan Lee on to Alexander. And, and it was one of those many thrills that we marveled at over the years was uh, the moment of Stan Lee's cameo appearances in the various Marvel movies that were made. W whenever they came up, my son and I would look at one another and I'd see this big, giant grin on his face because he knew that was Stan Lee and that was an important and exciting moment that the two of us shared. But simply... Much of my passion for writing and for storytelling can be traced back to the influence of Stan Lee. Enough said. So that's enough of the pre-interview chatter for me. I'm sure you want to dig into this great conversation with James Blatch. James, thanks so much for joining me here today. Hey, I'm so excited. I mean, here we are in a hotel room in vegas what could possibly what could possibly go wrong i know but the thing i'm very excited about is you're usually on the uh, interviewer side of the equation and i have been long fascinated with your own writing 
So that's uh, I'm excited to be able to put you in the hot seat. Well, it's it's. I always tell interviewees this. It's so much easier asking the questions. Answering them is really quite difficult. I know. That's why I want to put you in the hot yeah, seat. Yeah. So here I am. And yeah. actually, people should know that I'm I'm reclining on a chai long. There you go. Um, yeah, you, I made you comfortable, right? You look like my therapist. I, I, I want to talk therapist. to you about my daddy. Now, so. <laughs> I want to talk to you about your unfinished novel. <laughs> yes, which does involve my daddy. Oh, so, it does. Yeah. So we, we're going to go back to that. Yeah. Um, so I just uh, we are in Vegas, as you mentioned, and and you did a killer presentation this morning on on okay. using video. I do want to because it was so fascinating. And I learned so much from it. I do want to ask you a little bit about that before we start dragging you uh, over the coals uh, about your novel. Sure. So. Video. Uh, you were talking about uh, Facebook video as as, a, as an easy way uh, for an author to engage with community, but you kind of divided it up in terms of if you were doing nonfiction, you were doing fiction. What's the sort of preference that you like? Yeah, so I think if you look at uh, YouTube, is the biggest video platform on the planet, obviously, and it is the second biggest search engine. Um, so you'd think on the face of it, well, we should be on YouTube, right? But as authors, it doesn't quite work like that because people don't go onto YouTube and search romance books. You know, there's no general searching. Right. People go onto YouTube and do specific searching. Quite often, they'll type in, how do I change the fuse in my Chevrolet okay. or something, you know, and get yeah. an instructional video. So actually, if you're doing something, Brian Meeks was the example I pulled up off the top of my head this morning. If you're becoming a bit of an expert and a guru in an area, uh, and Mark Dawson, of course, is the same. YouTube's the perfect place for you. Right. So people search and who have a problem want it answered. How do I do a Facebook ad? Okay. Mark Dawson comes up. How do I do an AMS ad? Brian Mix should come up first, but we come up first. Because Brian's <laughs> not on YouTube, and I talked to him afterwards about that, and he's, okay. he's feeling energized. But for authors, the platform is not really a problem-solving result of a search. It's you engaging your readers building an army who are going to go out there and evangelize for you so you, your readers become more connected with you. And it's powerful like that. I mean, I've seen it over the years in BBC and my video production time. It's it's a very powerful medium when you're looking down the lens and talking to people and being personable, people feel like your friend. And that's right. really good for us authors. So Facebook is a really, Facebook Live is a really easy platform to use as well. So And speaking of friends, so this is an interesting thing because all the authors who meet you, you're in my head every week, right? You're, 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 people feel I felt I felt like I knew you before we met in person, and even podcasting gives you that sort of sense of intimacy. Yes, yeah, absolutely. In fact, you can argue that it's it's one of the the most intimate. Radio is basically what podcasting is, one of the most intimate forms of medium because you are particularly people listen on headphones. There's something about that, right. and uh, yeah. So I've been in the lift a few times having a conversation, and people said, "I know that voice." I've heard him, and yeah. you know they're so familiar with it, and yeah, they do feel like they know you. And do you know what, Mark? They do know me because I don't put on a. I'm not a special personality that gets switched on for the podcast. That's me. So, right. so they do know me a bit, and it's it's great. But you can do that with your readers as well. Um, and Facebook Live is a way of doing that, a way of just being yourself and people feeling engendered towards you and okay. supportive and want to be your team. Um, and as we demonstrated, because I did something insane, which was to yeah. set up a live Facebook Live with Mark Dawson in the UK. I was fairly sure it wouldn't work because the internet is flaky here. Uh, but amazingly, it worked. It worked um, brilliantly, yeah. And it just goes to show that it's, it's, you know, it's easy. It's, it's, the difficult bit is getting over the idea of being on TV type thing, yeah, um, which right. you just have to do more and you relax into it. And so, I mean, you have a uh, history as a broadcaster. You've been with the BBC and you've done that before. How did how did that help you transition into the new role that you have now as, as you know, podcast host and interviewer and, and videographer and all the yeah. things that you... I mean, that definitely helped. The last, last year or so of my BBC career, so I was a traditional journalist there, news reporter, and I had a camera guy. Or, or woman, but mainly a, a guy I worked with called Steve. And when I first joined, there was like sound guys and lighting guys there, but they went. Okay, so, so it was just you and the camera person. You and the camera guy, and he was holding the microphone. <laughs> um, and then he went. So oh, no, It was just you? Yeah, so in the last year oh, no, or really? so. No, really? A BBC? Like a the B big... This is the BBC, and this wow. is both at network and at regional. Now, there were still camera crews around. I've still okay. got friends doing that. But more and more, they wanted Jonas to go on this course <clears throat> where they trained you how to film with you, gave you a camera, gave you a laptop with Final Cut Pro in it with editing. Okay. And and they told taught you a method of journalism that was a more intimate way of making stories. Rather than doing the kind of traditional story, you went in, right. you spent some time at home with somebody, you really got to know them and filmed it in close quarters, and it was a different type of storytelling. I I saw it as um, cost-saving 
because that's what it looked like, you know, getting rid of the camera crews and right. giving me a report. So I, I was resistant for a long time. But then in the last year or so, I did it and loved it. And I don't know why I didn't do it before, because I loved the editing. I loved filming. I loved telling these stories in close quarters. It was liberating. Uh, at that point, I went off and did something else outside the BBC for a bit and ended up leaving the BBC and setting up a video company, really using those skills. Um, so I did a lot of filming myself, a lot of editing. So I brought that into SPF. Okay. Um, I do a lot of the video stuff. That, that's useful. Um, yeah. And so now this is going to be my segue into talking about your novel. How did that work as as a journalist and as a storyteller through visual medium? How did that help you in your goal towards novel writing? Well, that started the novel writing started. I did. I did. A, I've got a couple of starts of novels. I mean, one I did when I was still living with my parents at home. Oh, really? Yeah. So and I, how I did, long ago was oh, that? Oh, so this I was you know, probably nine, 17, 18, 19, around there, from okay. when I finally left home. Um, and I, want, I wrote this American military aviation sort of thing. I showed it to my dad, who was a little bit dismissive of it, I have to say. <laughs> Although yeah. I, it was sort of it's half encouraging, but it, like lots of things, you know, lots of people, it was a start and stopped. Did another one, I can't remember really when, my 20s. And then nothing happened for a long time. So I was 2010, how old am I? Um, so I was 40 then and did Nano did knew nothing about NaNoWriMo. Okay. And a friend tweeted on it and I saw this thing. He said, oh, I'm going to do this. And I clicked on it and literally didn't even read the rest of the page, what it was. Okay, so you write that number of words a day in November and you've got a novel. Turn that off, turn, open a Word document. Mm-hmm. And weirdly, this almost fully formed story came into my mind. Straight what, away. Like immediately. Immediately. And it hasn't changed really since then, okay. not, not in its fundamentals. I started writing it and got to the end of that, incredibly got to the end of it. So got 50,000, 55 odd thousand words by the end of November. Slowly over the next three or four months, wrote the rest of it. But So I got it to about 100,000 words. But it didn't make any sense because, of course, when you're just writing and not revising, right. You realise as you go on, okay, so I needed different things to have happened at the beginning and I needed to introduce characters earlier because I now need them here. Right. So you know, well, I'll go back and I'll do that. Okay. That whole revision process. But that's, by the end of it, it was it was too big a job and I, knew no, I had no idea what I was doing. And I couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. So eventually, well, then SPF started. Okay. Mark said to me, I, t- I told him about it. He said, get it out, do it. And he encouraged me. And I read one of his books, and his books are quite tight, you know, there's yeah. quite story, story, story. So I thought, okay, well, I'll strip everything out, uh, all the extraneous stuff. I'll set it over seven days, Monday or Friday to Friday, so eight days. And I wrote the story in its bare bones like that. It wasn't great, but I thought that's what I was doing right. And that was much shorter, it was like 50,000. Well, my editor had a look at it. Just really, we only did this for the one-on-one course. Right. And she gave me, yeah, she liked, she liked the characters in that story, but said, you know, there's quite a lot still wrong with it. And I got a bit lost then, just in the wilderness years of, of not really knowing how to fix it or whether I had to start again or what I was doing. And then in July this year, I did a podcast interview with Jenny Nash, who is runs the author. Yes. So you know Jenny. Yeah. So she runs the Author Accelerator program. She's not far from here, actually, in California. And she was brilliant to talk to for me. That was a great episode. Oh, yeah. she was brilliant. And she you, talked. You could hear the light bulbs oh going off God. in your head. When and you I'm were still on that high from that conversation <laughs> because she offers this program where, and it's not cheap, but you work hand, uh, hand in hand with an editor. So. Basically, they work through the outline at the beginning, and I'm in the middle of it now. Lizette Clark is my editor, and she gets my new chapters on a Tuesday. I get the notes back a few days later, so I do revisions, and then that, it's in that cycle of building okay. up. So you know, developmentally, it's being edited as you're going along. And crucially, for somebody who's never written a book or published a book before, you're getting feedback about whether it's working or not, right. which you don't get if you sit by yourself just writing. And of course, we fill ourselves with doubt about that. Um, and Jenny did something amazing at the beginning of this process. So I had this story written twice effectively in different ways. And she says, she asked me a load of questions. But one of the questions she asked me was, why do you need to tell this story? Mm-hmm. So I want to know why you, why you need to tell the story. And I wrote a page and a half. 
which was about my dad, about me, about how I was brought up, about the lack of emotion that exists in my father who was a test pilot. Uh, very, if you've anyone seen the Neil Armstrong film, that's pretty much my dad, very sort of closed up individual. They mm-hmm. were contemporaries as well, same time. And, um, and I realised I needed to tell the story because I wanted this character to sort of be a character at the same time and place as my dad, who, who in the end rejected that, rejected the, I'm not going to be unemotional, I'm not going to close myself up. Right. Because although it gets you through the day and it gets you through the sudden death of friends, which happens in test flying, um, is a price to pay for that for the rest of your life. It doesn't come without a cost. And I've, all this stuff came out and it was quite <laughs> emotional. And I, I was amazed myself with the art. I looked at the answer I'd written to this question and thought, wow. <laughs> that is that is why I need to tell the story, and she loved. She said that's why the story is going to work, because you need to. Tell, and that's why. And, and she pulled that out of you after how long that oh, story's been yeah, with you? Yeah, eight years. And that's why it was fully formed in my mind as well. Obviously, it's part of me. The story. So, so this is the book that's not necessarily, you know, the, the great commercial choice, but it's the story I need to write. The book I yeah, need to. You to have publish. to tell the story. Yeah. So uh, since working with Jenny, I know Mark teases you about it, and I've teased mm. you uh, off air. <laughs> you, you're, you're very welcome to <laughs> about this. Uh, I mean, the thing I love about uh, Self Publishing Formula podcast is the, the two writers, one just starting, and the other mm. dude writes too many novels a year, right? Like it's, nobody can keep up with them. Yeah. That kind. Of, so uh, I love that dichotomy. Um, but now that you, it seems imminent. Now, now th- there's a light at the end of the James Blatch unfinished novel tunnel, right? Is that yes. true? Are we yeah. seeing it? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm forty two thousand words into this developmental edit. Okay. Um, and actually, coming towards the end of Act One, so it feels like it's going to be quite long at the moment, and okay. I might have to revise that. But, but. If I project forward, if I write at the current... So this has not been a great week in Vegas, I have to say. I didn't right. write a word yesterday, but I did write all the days leading up to that while I've been away. Oh, you had been writing up until yeah. yesterday. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yesterday's the first day I haven't written a word in a long, long time. Uh, and I've been doing a minimum sort of 800 and often a couple of thousand words a day. So I've been really cracking on That's because I know what I'm doing now because I've got the direction and I, you know, I know. So it is butt in chair, fingers on keyboard for you. And yeah, you're it actually is now. committed. And that's oh, yeah. because of the relationship with Jenny probably. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And Lizette, who's actually, yeah, who's, so Jenny handed me off to Lizette. So Jenny helped out at the beginning. Oh, to so, get you going. Yeah. I mean, Jenny's like $3,000 a month to work with. Okay. She's really good. Uh, but she works with A-listers who, who hit right. the, the top 10. And then her, the Author Accelerator program is $450 a month. It's still nothing to be sniffed at at all. Right. I'm lucky in the position I am. I can I can pay for it, but it's, wow, it's worth every cent as far as I'm okay. concerned. Okay, and so your editor is now continuing that process with you. Yeah, yeah. And so she gives me, and it's been great, actually. Uh, she's American. She's here in, um, in Los Angeles. And I put a reference to Garfield Sobers, Gary Sobers, who's a fantastic, legendary cricketer. Uh, from Barbados in it, and she's squealing at me on the emails because she's from Barbados, and her oh. dad knows Gary Sobers, and oh, wow. she was so excited. <laughs> so we have a great relationship, and she's very excited about the book, and uh, is brilliant at telling me this is spot on, and you know, okay. this is where it's working, and, and and then putting question marks in. Well, you know, what's he thinking, and why did he do that? So I go back to the revisions, and I change what was a a throwaway line where she said this is quite an important moment, and right. turn that into five hundred pa- words. And that's so that, you know, by the time, we, so while long answer short, I think in sort of eight to 10 weeks from now, it should be done. Wow. I mean, awesome. it's done in terms of the yeah. developmental cut. Getting that piece done, yeah. Um, and then we have to do some editing after that. But that's So awesome. I'm quite excited. I'm very excited. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because, I mean, you get have had the opportunity, like most beginning authors do not have the opportunity to interview the people from the industry yeah. and, the, and the movers and shakers and all the fascinating things you get to learn. But it wasn't until you met Jenny or interviewed her that the right thing clicked at the right time for you. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was amazing. That was se- absolute serendipity. And I speak to Jenny now because she does our book lab. Um, in fact, Carlin from BookBub. Yes. So that was an amazing thing at Nink. <laughs> we didn't Carlin, realize, right? I had no idea. So Carlin from BookBub, who did a brilliant presentation this morning, she was at Nink as well, and Mark's chatting to her, and he invites me over, he's got this <clears> beam <throat> on his face. He said, this is Carlin from BookBub. And so guess who her mum is? And of course, it's Jenny Nash. <laughs> Jenny, yes, exactly. So the power family, and uh, she's lovely. Um, so yeah, she's, I mean, Jenny's like... And Carlin's uh, on her way to go see her now, actually. Oh, she so is, yeah, yeah. I did try and persuade Jenny <laughs> to come out here to Vegas, but... <laughs> I uh, couldn't get it. So that's where I am with that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's still, it is difficult. And I think about it a lot. And, you know, every, every one of us here 
who's writing a book knows that it's blood, sweat, and tears. Oh, yeah, and especially the first it. novel, because the first novel usually is something that, that, whether or not you recognize it immediately, something that resonates with you emotionally. Uh, that's something that's really, really deep, and it's a story you need to tell. Yeah, and this is definitely that. So, so is there, do you have, a, maybe it's too early, like, what's your elevator pitch when people ask about the novel? And we say, well, what's the novel about? And you say, well, it's about eight weeks from being finished. Yes. <laughs> no, but, but what is it? Like, do you have a, a, a yeah, thing that you tend my, to use yet? My elevator pitch, I guess, I should work this out better, but it's um, it's about a, a young test pilot and an older engineer who work together on a squadron, and the older engineer is killed in a flying accident at the hands of the young pilot that's flying. Not his fault. Oh. And after he dies, he starts. the old engineer starts giving up his secrets, and the young pilot realises that he should have been listening to him, that something was going on in the unit, um, and he regrets bitterly not having conversations with him while he was alive. And his only way of uh, assuaging the guilt he feels is to hunt down what he was uncovering and carry on his task. So that's the story. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's great. I tell you, like, I, have I ever heard the title? Uh, the Last Flight. The Last Flight. But I'll yeah. tell you the Jenny Nash intervention, the biggest single intervention that she and Lizette made together on this, is that my right. book started with the crash. So the f- opening chapter was, was, the, crash. was okay. the description of this flight, and in the middle of it all goes wrong. It start with a bang, right? Yeah, start with a bang. Which, exactly. seems yeah. like the right thing to do. It's how you open a James Bond film. And, and this young guy is stunned at that that Millie, the old, older guy, is dead and starts giving up her secrets. And it was all a bit mysterious and I was making some rookie errors, I suppose, in keeping too much concealed and so on. And then Jenny said to me, just, Jenny and Lizette, just, just write down what the secret is, what, what's Millie been up to? So I did a page and a half on that and they both said to me, that's the book. So it was a really compelling page and a half describing how Millie worked out that something's not working and that the establishment are ignoring it because it's going to cost RAF lives they can just write off as pilot error in the future and he was having none of it right and they were closing in on him so they said start the book there let's have whole of act one is with millie and rob and their relationship oh, wow. rob the young guy <clears throat> being having his head turned by the fancy test pilots his world right. and millie becoming a bit of a pain going on about this the whole time and rob not really listening and suddenly rob's uh, millie's dead rob feels guilty which is a big shock at the end of act one because it may, people think the story is about Millie for the first act. Yeah. And then he's going to be killed and Rob <sighs> is left by himself. So it's it, like my, a George R. R. Martin character preservation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I love him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it works much better. I mean, the book suddenly works. Oh, then a, you get that, that emotional impact is a lot stronger than yeah. the reader, which is great. And Millie's approaching retirement and we've got lots of stuff with him and his wife. I'm milking it. Oh, <laughs> that's fantastic. I love that. That's fantastic. Mm. But let's go back to your passion about aviation. Mm. There's a lot of that in the novel. Now, that came from your father? Or where yeah. Did that come from? So my dad was a test pilot in uh, in Britain. So he started in the RAF in, in the very early 50s, flew for the fif- flew the 50s and 60s. Was a test pilot for six years. At the sort of time, if people have seen the right stuff, the um, right. early Mercury astronauts, that was he was one of them, but in Britain, okay. effectively. In fact, they met each other quite a lot and came over and flew. Um, and... He stopped flying when I was a baby, so I never really saw him. I saw him doing hovercraft work, which he did after the plane work, but never really got the bug when I was a kid and never saw him, and he never really encouraged it with me. But as I've got older, and I think as you get older, you become a bit more interested in your parents. You start to see them as people rather than yes. <laughs> taking them for granted, and you want to know who they were, where they came from, and where, where you come from. And I've got his logbooks, which are amazing because wow. every flight is logged. Yeah. So you take March the 12th, 1956, I'll tell you where my dad was. Wow. You know, at 10.14 in the morning, he was at RAF Luca in Malta and he flew to, you know, so it's, so it's amazing to have that. Wow. Um, and I started to do some work on that, so I researched all the aircraft he flew and plotted where they went and presented him in the book that, that listed his flying career. So there was, there was a passion in me for that era, for who he was, um, but I also knew that he came out of it scarred. Right. A bit like a World War One soldier coming out of his gun. His father was a World War One soldier. So he didn't have a great start emotionally in life with a sort of difficult, cantankerous dad. And he just, my dad's, you know, I love him, obviously, but he's a closed up individual. Right. My mum used to say, just just say, even if you're going to tell me you're leaving me, just say something. Yeah. My dad didn't <laughs> want to have the fights, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, half of me is that. Half of me is my exuberant mum who is yeah. full of life and half of me is this, I don't want to yeah. face the emotion <laughs> of it. Um, and I'm interested in I'm interested in the 
damage is too strong a word, but the effect on on a generation of English men this stiff upper lip. Oh yeah, has yeah. so that's what that's a the theme of the book. Yeah. Oh, that is really great. This is, I mean, I can't wait to read this. Oh, thank you, Mark. Which is really, really exciting. Um, so you're you're about eight weeks away from that. Um, one of the challenges a lot of writers face is um, midway through a project, you you you're chasing the next squirrel. There's yes, the next, and have other ideas come to you that you've had to put park and say no, get this done. Yeah, but from everything Mark teaches me and you guys teach me and you sort you you you, you know you soak up here um, at conferences like this is I think I should be thinking about the prequel or the sequel and how this is going to work and so I've started to have those ideas and Jenny was very much at the beginning is this going to be a series let's think about that so right. the last chapter so I think I've got the series worked out so um, you know the young pilot who ends up working very closely with a, a young uh, MI6 officer okay. who comes in to help him out and I think she spots in him that he could be somebody they could leave in certain places of British military to help them oh, okay. uncover corruption so there's potential sequel but I haven't worked out any stories there but I like the idea of doing a prequel to this so there's an American exchange <laughs> guy who I've invented and he's not in the book very much only in a couple of scenes his name's Red Brunson he's from Edwards Air Force Base um, in California he's over in Boscombe Down on an exchange and I want to do a prequel about why he's there. And I've come up with this idea of a, a book. Something it might be called Redneck, might be the name of it. And the idea is, is there's this this southern, typical sort of young kid redneck, but a brilliant aviator, like crop duster who builds his own aeroplanes, shapes the wings to get better efficiency out of them. The guys at Edwards hear about this and think, this we've got to get this guy flying with us as a test pilot. But he's actually a Russian plant. Oh wow! And they set him up. They set up Edwards, and he flies off with them best jet and once they go up and do an exercise in Alaska that's it he's in the air heading right. to Russia it's a short story uh, Red Brunson's the guy who has to try and bring it down and oh, he ends up cool. so that's my so I am thinking about that should I be thinking so, about the next well I, I think yeah and putting those ideas aside because then maybe you build something into the character that's like a, an easter egg for yes. the next reader but again and it, it could be a, a story in the same universe yeah and that yeah. could be that one story there could be multiple ones which is which is fantastic but yeah yeah, um, I, I that'll like the just, that'll just help sell the first book. Yes, exactly. Which is uh, <laughs> nothing sells your first book, like your next book, your last book, like your next book, like your next book. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, I like the idea of doing different <clears throat> stories in the same universe rather than specifically because I'm not whether yeah. this Rob thing will work or not. I don't know. But. That's cool. So, and I want to go back to uh, Novelist Inc., which we mentioned uh, mm. in Florida a few weeks ago or a month ago. Or yeah, something whenever like that. that was. <laughs> last time we saw each other, yeah. and. Um, and you got to fly a plane. Yes, I'd like to hear about that. Did you not no, do it? No, no. I, I was um, I was on a beer tour that day oh, while you guys were flying. That sounded so. brutal. That beer tour. I'm quite pleased <laughs> I flew. I definitely don't combine them. Um, yeah, Nathan Van Coops. Who, funnily enough, I appeared on his podcast yesterday. We were filmed that over oh, there that's with right. the see, yeah. with the fountain in the background. It was quite noisy. <laughs> um, yeah, so he's a pilot. Uh, he's an instructor, actually, at the airfield there on, on St. Petersburg. And he very kindly, it must have cost him, because these things cost you know, $100 an hour to fly. Uh, but he got us all lined up. I flew with Margaret Lashley, sat in the back. And I had a pilot's license in my 30s. haven't flown for a while, but Nathan just said, you fly. So, so you actually took over I the took plane. off. The only thing I didn't do was the landing. I'd like to have done the landing, but there were some cranes that you had to do a slight maneuver around on short finals and there. And it had been a while, so... And it'd been a while. Yeah, but I felt I could have done the landing. Landings, oh. it's what it's all about, landing. Anyone can fly straight and level and do a few turns, but landing's where the heart beats a little faster. And That's cool. I was so excited when I saw that you got to do that, having hear, heard you talk about your novel. So I, what I'm really curious about, though, is are there any elements from that recent flight that you have already worked into your book? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I know quite a lot about flying. I've been lucky with my flying. So I did my own flying flying license, which is 40 or 50 hours right. of instruction. Then flew probably another 40 or 50 hours just for fun. I've flown in RAF fast jets in low-level wow. scenarios, twice in a Harrier, once in a Jaguar. And there, those they were full missions. So I was there from the beginning of the mission in the in the jet for the, feeling quite unwell at various points. And through that, I've flown in... Hercules transports, I've had jump seat rides in airliners, all because of my BBC career. So I've got quite a lot of that little detailed knowledge, right. which makes it a bit more authentic. So I'm not sure the flight in St. Petersburg added much more to what I already knew, to be honest, but okay. I just okay. enjoyed it. 
Oh, that's cool. It was just to, to, to relive that sort yeah. of uh, experience. So I'm going to take you one last question. Mm-hmm. Is um, When you think back to that young James, uh, that first NaNoWriMo, when he mm. was just about to start to tell this story. Well, well, that young, but yeah. When that young James, we'll call him young James. Yes. When that young James got discouraged, thinking that this was never going to happen, what would you tell him? What would you go back and, and tell him? Yeah, I think I would say anything is fixable. And just because it feels like you can't do it doesn't mean it can't be done. It's obvious that if you just apply yourself um, and learn a bit, you can fix it. And I think probably you shove it away because you just can't see a way of doing it. But that's silly, really, because obviously books do get written yeah. by people. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what I would tell myself. But on the other hand, you know, ruminating on a story and having it in your mind for eight years is not a bad thing. And some some you know traditional writers who've written much better books than me have done it that way. They've just spent a long time gestating the story. Yeah, I do. I mean, fine wine. Yeah, well, we're in twenty <laughs> books, which is all about pumping them out, right? And yeah. um, and I definitely do want to you know have a, a a kind of catalog at some point. But this book is not quite that. This book is is the labour of love more than anything else. So. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Let's uh, tell my listeners where they can find out more about you. Yeah, so jamesblatch.com. Okay. There's a, there are a couple of James Blatches in the world. There's, um, the other one's a bodybuilder in Sydney, okay. who unfortunately he's was... nowhere near as tough as you. No, no, well, yeah. he's he's now in prison. He's not in prison, oh. but he's been arrested <laughs> for a supply of steroids, but he's fighting it. I, I follow his case very carefully, <laughs> because I get his emails occasionally. I get an email that says, great work on the abs on Tuesday. I'm oh. looking forward to the quads <laughs> on Thursday. Um, and I forward it on to him and he says, thank you. But he he, uh, he got arrested and uh, he's just sacked his law- legal team, got a new legal team, so he's going to go. It's a very <laughs> slow process. So I'm not him. Okay. Big guy. So jamesblatch.com. You yeah, are a dot .com. James Blatch. I've got the dot .com. Oh, yeah. Excellent. So I was quite pleased about it because I thought he might have that. Um, and of course, self-publishing formula is, is selfpublishingformula.com as well. So. Awesome. Well, James, thank you for inspiring authors every week and, and, and thanks for writing and working on this book. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Oh yeah. I can't wait for you to read it. I'm, I'm privileged if you do so. And I feel like I've, uh, been cleansed. Have, have we, have we worked through everything yeah. in, in, yeah. in a nice way? So how much is this again? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's free. It's oh, wow. <laughs> you're the best story <laughs> ever. Have you a drink. That'll yeah, yeah. Let's okay. do that. Thanks a lot. I admire how, even though this is his first novel and it's still not complete, that James is focused on the big picture, the long term, and creating the best book that he can. He recognizes that it's not all about the first novel, but he also recognizes the huge landmark and the huge achievement that finishing this first novel represents. And he has good humor about it, too. And again, he's not... He's not rushing to get this first novel done. He's enjoying and benefiting from the process of working on it with a pro like Jenny Nash. And I'll be sure to provide a link to the uh, interview James did with Jenny for the Self-Publishing Formula podcast so you can pick up on the value that she brings to writers if you haven't already intuited that from what James says here because it's really cool to hear directly from Jenny herself. Um, And the basic value that she brings to the writers she works with. So... His first novel is in progress, but he already has a vision of the long term with respect to his own writing career, and that's something that I really, really admire. And this kind of brings me around to the latest drama in the indie author world. The Amazon apocalypse of 2018, or whatever people are calling it, the dumpster fires, etc. And if you listen to the buzz from the self-publishing world... That's what you think is happening. Now, what I'm talking about is the, the, the fact that titles from Amazon.com seeming to disappear or at least uh, have the buy buttons uh, removed with a, a note that says that this book is not available. And it's happening to thousands of titles. And it's not just indie author titles, but general titles. And the fact that it's happening to all titles um, sort of lends itself to the explanation uh, of what is actually happening. Not that Amazon is out to get us or try to do anything mean or cruel to us. It's just the latest in this big drama that's distracting writers from the long term or from the big picture. 
Now, first, I should pause to say, I am not making light of this issue. If you are suffering from this issue, I am not making fun of you. I'm not making light of it at all. I recognize the seriousness of what we believe this represents. But bear with me, please. Because I think there's a potential seriousness um, to, to what authors think is happening. In fact, it happened to me a few weeks ago to one of my more recent and successful titles that had been selling really, really well. And I also noticed at the same time that this book's buy button uh, disappeared, that the consistent and steady sales dried up. What I don't know is if the petering out of sales and the fact the title wasn't available for sale were actually related. In my panic, I assumed they were related. But that's not always the case. Because here's what I found out. Now, the Amazon rep, who took more than a week and a half to get back to me, and yes, that was a very long week. I tried not to focus only on that. Um, they were confused because they sent me a screenshot. And they could see that my title was available for sale all along. They're in the U.S. I'm in Canada. Now, if I went to Amazon.ca, I could see that the title was purchasable. It just wasn't purchasable for me in Canada on the Amazon.com site. Perhaps because I've worked for an ebook store and, and I know the way that the Kobo store operates, it made sense to me. Amazon was finally following the protocol that they should have been following all along. Simply, they, they have eight or nine versions of their site, which has always been, in my mind, a mess and a confusing, unnecessary whatever. But I recognize it's based on physical distribution laws. They have Amazon.com for the US, Amazon.ca for Canada, Amazon.co.uk for the UK, and .de for Germany, etc, etc, etc. Even their payments come separately as these uh, separate um, business entities where I make most of my money from Amazon.com and Amazon.uk and then I get these you know, 50 cent <laughs> monthly uh, payments from the .de site or, or, or some of the other sites where uh, the money's not as, uh, as big. But even though Amazon is a global company, there are pushbacks that they're likely facing from country and state tax entities, not to mention the global distribution mess that was born out of traditional publishing. Uh, you see, there's distribution laws, mostly due to the nature of how large publisher titles are distributed and how agents would sell rights to different publishers in different countries. Now, even within a massive uh, conglomerate like the world's largest publisher, so the Penguin, uh, Penguin Random House uh, Canadian version of a Margaret Atwood book, for example, can only be sold in Canada. Uh, whether through stores or, or online. And the U.S. edition of that very same book, which sometimes even has a different cover, um, is also owned by Penguin Random House, but it's owned by Penguin Random House U.S., and that can only be sold in the U.S. And, and the same would go for the U.K. edition. And then there's a really more confusion when it comes to the international edition because there's crossovers and Commonwealth and all these different things that happen. But this border control that was built for the physical distribution of products because... Uh, a company uh, would basically, Penguin Random House Canada, for example, would have to pay for the rights to have the Canadian version because they wanted to, well, they don't even do this in all cases, but warehouse it in Canada and dis distribute it in Canada. Or a third-party company would, uh, for example, with the J.K. Rowling titles, with the Harry Potter titles, you had Scholastic uh, had bought the rights to this U.K. book uh, to distribute in, in the U.S., but Raincoast, a Canadian distributor, bought the Canadian rights. And so that's where that is born out of. And then you move that exact same business model into digital, which doesn't work the same way, and then the confusion begins. But Kobo has always handled that very efficiently. They're providing almost the exact same browsing and shopping experience in 190 countries, no matter how you get to Kobo, unlike the way Amazon did it. The Kobo uses write restrictions, they use currency displays, etc. But they made it transparent. If you go to Kobo.com, no matter where you are in the world, and you look up near the top of the screen, you see this little country flag indicating what version of the site you have been automatically pushed to. For me, because my IP address is in Canada, I'm going to see the Canadian flag. If you're looking at the Kobo.com site from the U.S., you'll see a little U.S. flag. If you're in the U.K., you'll see a U.K. flag. If you're in Australia, Australia, Germany, etc., etc. 
you can click on that flag and you can be taken to a screen where you can choose other country views so that you can see how your title or, or, or the main store is merchandised and how it looks in another country. You can see the converted price to euros or US dollars or Australian dollars or New Zealand dollars, for example. You can see the listing, you can see the ranking, etc. But Amazon never did that. They built the world's biggest bookstore on Amazon.com, the world's biggest stuff store and everything store on Amazon.com. They put all their eggs, all their money, all their power, all their resources into it. They built an amazing site that people from around the world use. And then they created these smaller, lesser other stores for Canada, etc. Now, now I can't really speak to the other stores because I haven't really looked at them, but I, but I have looked at the Amazon.ca store. And I'm sorry, but the Canadian version of the Amazon store sucks. It is shitty. It's terrible. I, I shouldn't say that. It's a decent store, but compared to Amazon.com, it's terrible. It doesn't have many of the features that the US or the, uh, the .com of the site has. It's like a second or third class citizen. They invested very little into it. They kind of like stuck it up, probably because for some legal reason they had to have that. And and likely millions of other Canadians like me who went to it and were not impressed went back to Amazon.com and continued to use that because the Amazon.ca site is garbage when compared to Amazon.com. But now that they seem to be forcing Canadians, for example, away from Amazon.com and into Amazon.ca, people like me are seeing that titles we want to buy might no longer be available. And it's unraveling in a massive confusion, and particularly in the indie author world, needless panic. Because right after my book, The Seven P's of Publishing Success, was fixed, they actually did fix this after a couple weeks, and the buy button returned for me in Canada, my even better selling and newer title, Killing It on Kobo, then had its buy button disappear, which was a bit more of a panic because it was a higher selling title. And yet, when I pause to look at the sales trends for that book, I'm still getting sales even though there is no buy button, at least from what I can see here in Canada. And most of my sales are coming from the U.S. store, as per normal. I rarely sell anything on the Amazon.ca site. Of course, now that Amazon seems to be trying to abide by these territory restrictions, perhaps my sales outside of Amazon.com and sales in the Canadian site will be fixed. Perhaps they'll invest more in making the non.com and non-UK versions of Amazon robust and, and better shopping experiences so we don't have to look at .com for anything useful as customers. And, and since I'm not a Kindle reader, I'm talking about shopping there for print books and other non-print books products because you know I buy my ebooks at Kobo because I've always had that and it's always been a great experience. But does this mean that my previous panic over the buy button from the other title was related to the missing buy button or was it related to some other natural sales trend pattern? It's really hard to tell. Now David Gogren crafted a blog post that I'll link to in the show notes talking about this issue that easily cuts to the matter. And it's funny because I've seen people who apparently have read and referred to it mention this, even talk about it, but then they still panic over the issue. So you can go to your KDP account and click on the title and see its availability via various Amazon global sites like .com, .ca, etc. So for the U.S., some of my titles show limited availability under Amazon.com. And when I click on it, it shows this giant list of hundreds of countries and uh, whether it's available or not. And I can see that in the U.S. my title is indeed available. So uh, an American uh, looking at the .com site will see it available. Um, and it's available in many other countries, but it's not available in Canada, nor in uh, several other countries um, as well. So for example, I have to go to Amazon.ca in Canada to see it as available. So I did that a couple of times just to check it out. Now I'm done. And I'm getting tired of trying to talk other authors off the ledge when they begin to panic about this horrible atrocity that's ending their world. Again, I'm not mocking and I'm not making fun because it's, it's really difficult to reason or to think straight when you're panicked. And I was a panicking author when I first found this on my titles and, and I perhaps even misread the data I was looking at. Now, fortunately for me, I've been in the book industry long enough to know that sales go up and down, trends happen, and half the time it's difficult to determine the cause. Sales ebb and flow. The sales decline I saw likely wasn't due to the trend, or maybe it was. 
maybe there were Canadians who, like me, only shop on Amazon.com and were buying Kindle books that way and, and couldn't buy my book. So maybe I, maybe I did lose some sales. But it'll work itself out, even if Amazon doesn't fix it. Because if shoppers don't like their experience on Amazon.ca for Kindle titles, for example, they'll find another way to shop and to buy the things that they want to buy and read. There are plenty of other options. I've decided not to waste my time panicking. I'm going to spend my time working on the next book, working on other formats. Now, fortunately, I have published most of my books wide to all retailers, or as many as I can get to, and therefore am not 100% dependent upon Amazon for my writing income. This, in my mind, is yet one more example of why it's important not to put all your eggs in a single basket. Yes, for me, Amazon's among the two places where I earn the most money as a writer, but, but even if there is an Amazon apocalypse, I still have Kobo sales, and, and I've been trying to work at growing my sales on Apple Books and on Nook, and even in a really, 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 really small way so far <laughs> on Google. Although, you know, my Google sales, if you look at certain stats, could be up hundreds of percent this year over the past 10 years. But I've, I've been working at growing my audiobook sales as well, mostly through Findaway Voices and mostly through library and library model sales channels. So that's been, again, expansion selling into the library market, not just into retail market. So again, publishing wide in as many ways as possible, not just on as many retailers. And I suppose that the stark reflection that I wanted to share was essentially this, boiled down to a nutshell. Sometimes things aren't what they seem to be, and that can set us off to panic. So it's important to look at the actual data, not at the hype, not at the panic, not at the high anxiety. And are you wasting your time focusing on that anxiety when your time might very well be better spent working on writing the next book? I know it's a difficult thing to consider when it appears that the walls are crumbling down around you. But in all the hype and hoopla around this, I've yet to see any author actually share actual concrete details showing a direct relation between the decline in sales directly related to this. There's been lots of hype and panic, but it's mostly about the disappearing buy buttons and I'm not seeing actual stats about sales. And it's been happening for a few weeks now. So even though I had my own apparent direct correlation example, I have a second example where there is no correlation. And I haven't seen anyone else post anything other than generic, my Amazon sales and page reads have slowed down messages. Generic messages, I'm sorry, but there's no data to back it up. I'm going to have to go with the data. That's probably just a regular ebb and flow that's happening anyways. And it's being attributed to this. So I've decided not to panic I've decided to be thankful that I have options as a writer, that I am not all in with one option, and that there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of on the shores of the world's longest river. So again, that was a longer reflection. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Thanks so much for listening to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. I hope that if you're suffering from this, that you can take a step back, take a look at the the listing that David Gogren showed so that you can reveal that your, your books are probably still available on Amazon.com, which is the place where most Amazon sales happen anyways, and get on with writing that next book. Get on with working on that next project. If you're doing NaNoWriMo, it's halfway through the month now. Get back to NaNoWriMo. Get that next book written and published. Again, it's Mark Leslie Lefebvre for the Stark Reflections podcast. Thanks for joining me in this episode, and I look forward to chatting with you next week. And until next week, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.